Hello, hello, hello. So now we're going to deal with controversy for real, man. Uh, all you got to do is listen to the music. As uh, Miles Davis said the first time he heard this guy, he said, man, that cat's all messed up inside, man. He's just all messed up. <laughs> We're talking about Ornette Coleman. Yeah, we're talking about Randolph, Denard, Ornette, Coleman. Born in 1930 in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's a big part of the story. Fort Worth in 1930 was not an oasis for black achievement and comfort and happiness. <laughs> there were a lot of restrictions in 1930 in Fort Worth, Texas. There had been a school established there back in the 1800s uh, during Reconstruction. And it was led by this principal named Terrell, who eventually left it and went on to become the very first president, I believe, of Prairie View uh, State College. Uh, they called it something else then. They called it Prairie View, but it was some other, you know, agriculture and industrial, something like that, but Prairie View. Anyway, uh, once he left, they named the uh, old school after him. Uh, the school had um, no gymnasium initially, no cafeteria, and, and no library. This was a sort of uh, separate but equal education that was provided in Fort Worth, Texas in those early years. Over time, buildings were added and programs were added, and even a music program was added by the 1940s when Ornette Coleman would have been passing through. Uh, his music teacher there was Stern. We know that for sure. Stern. Some people said he was a proponent of jazz, and some people said that he hated jazz. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I work at both kinds of directors. <laughs> I can tell you that among some of the older black trained musicians, you could find. <laughs> those personalities present in abundance. Those who love jazz and those who hate it, they were both there side by side. At any rate, one had learned to play saxophone, probably the tenor, he bought a bottom one. And uh, he did well until one day they were rehearsing the um, Washington Post March and uh, Ornette decided he started improvising with it, adding some licks that he thought should have been in that march. <laughs> Well, this did not sit well with the director, and shortly thereafter, he was exited from the music program. Hmm. That's a story very similar to mine. <laughs> Except I at least waited I got to college to get that bowl. But anyway, my high school band director was a proponent of jazz, and not so much uh, when I went to college. Um, at any rate, uh, the funny thing is, there were other people in the band of like mind. Charles Moffat, the father of Jeanette Moffat, the great bass player, doing the drummer, and you know, a few other people, Sasha, and you know, a lot of guys that were in that band that loved improvisational music. And for them, it was just a chance to play. So. It may not be hard jazz, it may be R&B, because at least you could get a gig playing at a dance or social event. And maybe you could play a couple of hit R&B tunes and play one jazz tune for your own satisfaction and then get right back at R&B. And this is kind of what Ornette was doing. And then he had a chance to play with this New Orleans review that came through kind of a variety show that 
produced uh, concerts and events in tents. It was a tent show. They come to your little town. What the auditorium was in those days, forget about it. They set up a big old tent. They charged tickets and people would come in and watch the show. Of course, if you didn't have any money, it's just a tent. You could stand out on the ground to hear everything you wanted to hear for free. But for those people that had the money, they would go in and take a seat and get the full benefit of the visual as well as the audio um, production. As a young kid, I saw many of these uh, from the street. <laughs> I don't ever remember going inside one of those tent shows. But this is what Ornette is doing. And this is probably um, late 40s, mid 40s, early 50s. And then he had a chance to get with a band that was also an R&B band, but they were traveling to L.A. And he liked that. So he headed to L.A. playing his saxophone and these R&B bands and doing these little shows, playing the blues and whatnot. And uh, evidently he, he got into a scuffle some kind of way. After one of these little gigs, these things normally were kind of rough. Rough people came. Sometimes they would have too much firewall in them and be a little aggressive. And so Ornette was attacked one night. And he wasn't attacked alone. He had his saxophone with him. Was, his saxophone was attacked too <laughs> and, and didn't survive. So for a while, in order to make money, uh, Ornette had to... Uh, work as an elevator operator out there in L.A. And he eventually bought himself another saxophone, but he didn't have very much money. Elevator operator, he pretty much working for tips. So he bought something he could afford, which was a plastic saxophone. And there are many photographs of him with this white plastic saxophone. And first, he hated the sound of that thing, <laughs> but it was all he could afford. So that's what he did. And later on, he grew to, you know, at least tolerate it. But he had other friends out there in, uh, in California. You know, we talk about the cool jazz, that real sedate thing, you know, Jerry Mulligan and old boys. But there was something else going on out there. It was a lot more cutting, a lot more freely improvisational. Some people call it free jazz. We'll come back to that. But we'll just call it avant-garde, groundbreaking, unorthodox. And that is what he went after. And he found some people out there that, that were like mine. Young Don Cherry on trumpet, who was a teenager, and Ed Blackwell and Biggie Higgins, and a young bass player um, who came out of the country Midwest playing in his parents' country gospel folk band on bass and singing. And that's Mr. Charlie Hayden, one of the most beloved bass players in jazz, especially modern experimental jazz. So here these guys are creating what will become the most groundbreaking experimental jazz of the 50s with a bass player who normally played Roots and Five in a country band. Yeah, they're playing all this stuff. And um, this uh, experimentation that they had uh, continued. Um, other people were brought in at various times. Uh, Dewey Redman, who had come from uh, Terrell High School, he was there, and Ronald Shack uh, Shannon Jackson would come through at another time. And later on, um, on its own son, Donato, would join the band when he was 10 years old. Uh, so a lot of what Ornette was really came out of Fort Worth and that Terrell High School situation. And many people say, even Arnett says, when he left Texas, the only thing he took with him was the blues. When he left Texas, 
The only thing he took with him was the blues. And no matter what, if you listen to his most far out, strange sounding music, his most experimental stuff, shape of jazz to come or whatever, uh, beauty. Um, even earlier, the very first album he did, something else. Um, you're going to find a lot of blues in there. So eventually, these guys make it from the West Coast to the East Coast. And they start playing around, or they start playing around, and eventually the other guy's following. And um, he'd laugh off the stage a lot. That cat can't play, playing number noise, man, just random notes. They ain't, oh no. And of course, Miles, he all messed up on the inside, and so and so and so and so and so. But by the time he released his first album, which was something else, and his second album was called uh, Tomorrow is the Question. He got more down that road. By the time he released The Shape of Jazz to Come, he was full on experimenting with avant-garde. And it was so different from what was going on in the jazz world in terms of structure and form and harmonics and chord changes and modalities and all of that in time that people started calling it free jazz. And it wasn't free jazz, and, and Arnie never liked that title. But later on, he would do an album called Free Jazz, A Collective Improvisation. And that free jazz, which was only a record title, would be attached to him as a mantra from that point on. Oh, Arnie is a high priest of free jazz. He never liked a term because at first glance, at first listen, when you hear his music, you might think it's just completely random. But listen closer. And you will hear there are themes, there's form, and a piece like The Lonely Woman. They had a very identifiable melody that they keep coming back to. There are these little catchphrases and motifs and riffs and excerpts that they keep coming back to as a collective. So it's not free, it's structured. There's just a lot of freedom within that structure for people to create what they want to do. Only the first album really used the piano, something else. And that pianist was also working uh, with, with uh, Charlie Mingus. And uh, he got into a... Uh, a beef with Charlie Mingus. Mingus was very, very short-tempered. And one night while they get ready for a gig, the guy called, called Mingus Charlie. Well, Mingus thought that was insulting. His name was Charles. You don't call me Charlie. My name is Charles. And so at the point that this piano player was just about to get a big beat down, uh, the manager came through and said, everybody's leading on stage right now. That saved this guy's life. Um, he was working with Ornette Coleman and Charlie Mingus, so he's playing, you know, experimental music. As it turned out, when he finished the gig with Mingus, uh, he got on the phone and found a gig in Berlin, Germany. <laughs> and he moved to Berlin, and he never came back to the States. And so... I guess that's why Ornette never had another piano player because that guy was gone. And when someone asked this guy years later, man, why'd you just leave that guy? He says he was deathly afraid of Charles Mingus. So, Mingus, come on, man. You ruined Ornette's band and you created this whole music where now there's no chordal instrument. There's nobody playing dominant chords or minor chords or susses or extensions or alterations. There's just a bass player, sometimes two bass players, sometimes two drummers, sometimes a double quartet with trumpet and sax and bass and drums. You just never know what's going to show up, but there's probably not going to be an adherence to a harmonic structure. He liked to say, 
a combination of harmony and melody together so they were not separate one from the other. And you can hear that as the players are freely improvising, I did not say free jazz, you can hear that people are tracking and forming and mimicking each other and following each other's lead. And the music has really a pretty logical development. It's quite intricate. And the big difference with Ornette's music is you have to concentrate and you have to listen to it more than you would in any other type of ensemble. Now, Ornette was also very, very smart. There was a time when Great Britain put a cap on the number of jazz musicians they would let visit. I guess they were developing their own little jazz scene in Great Britain and they didn't want these African-Americans coming all over, stealing all the work from their British jazz musicians, so they put a cap on how many. Well, Ornette played sax, he also played a little trumpet, and he played violin. I won't say how well, I've heard it. I don't think he could have made it into New York Philharmonic, let's do it that way, okay? All right, but he does use the instrument in a very experimental way, uh, the same as he uses saxophone, trumpet, and everything else that he ever touched. Um, so he started doing these little chamber things involving strings. That way, he could class himself as a classical musician and thereby not be subject to the limit on jazz musicians that could travel to Europe, especially the UK, and that is how he was able to do a little bit more touring uh, to the UK where the audience was more open to what he was doing. One of his uh, best uh, albums is a live album that's done in Stockholm. So he had probably more support for what he was doing uh, in Europe than in America because we tend to be very conventional here and the Europeans all seem always to be looking for the next new thing. Uh, they're always pushing the envelope, the avant-garde is what they are really uh, looking for. And that in their art, their fashions, uh, their music, it's just their culture. Um, at any rate, uh, as things would evolve, we get into the 70s, and uh, Ornette, once again, uh, he kind of rotates with it a little bit. Um, he ended up uh, having his quartet uh, with Cherry and Blackwell and uh, Hayden uh, do a concert with uh, Yoko Ono in 1970. So he's crossing over into some rock and things like that. And uh, matter of fact, one of the songs is on her uh, 1970 album. Uh, he also uh, opened up for some Grateful Dead concerts. Uh, matter of fact, the Deadheads were into uh, Ornette Coleman. And there are a couple of uh, pieces where uh, Jerry Garcia is a guest artist and collaborator on some of the music that Ornette was doing. And this is after he's now in the 70s and has switched to a more electric sound with electric bass provided by Jamala Dean to Takuma and Ron Shannon, Shannon Jackson is playing drums and Donato is there sometimes. So, it's a great, great, great band. Um, and he even did some collaborations with Pat Metheny. So although we have all this controversy about Ornette and what he did and what he didn't do, and was he a good player, was he a bad player, was he a good composer, a bad composer, we have all this controversy. Understand, he got a Pulitzer surprise for music he wrote in 2006. He's got another Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. He's got several uh, honorary doctorates. He was praised by Leonard Feather and even Leonard Bernstein praised his work. So among higher musical, artistic intellectuals, they got what Ornette was doing. A lot of us quote, normal, unquote, people 
it took us a while to open our eyes and ears and hearts to hear and feel what Ornette was doing. Here's what I can tell you, some things I picked for myself. He's always playing the blues. There's always some kind of a structure. There's always some kind of a swing, some kind of a groove, even when it's three or four groups at the same time. Group improvisation has been with us since the very beginning. When you had cornet and filigree with the uh, clarinet and trombone playing something against that, New Orleans jazz, it was always that way. So to see what Ornette is doing in the modern age and go, man, that's not jazz. Oh, yes, it is. That tradition of group improvisation, or as Joe Zavnu said, everybody solos, nobody solos. Yeah, everybody is doing their thing as a soloist. But those solos are dependent and developed from what the individual players are hearing the players around them doing. It is a partnership of ideas that continues to intermingle and develop throughout the course of the performance, guided by limited restrictions in the form of the composition. That's pretty much what's going on. Um, so I'm going to say Ornette was way ahead of himself and he's certainly a genius and he certainly could play the saxophone. I'm not sure how good a violinist he was, a trumpet player he was, but he was an awesome composer and great saxophone player and his work has not been lost. We look at some of our best modern jazz musicians today whether it be Bradford Marcellus, you can hear Ornette in a lot of the compositions that Bradford writes and in his playing and in the way his group interplays in some of the more extended pieces because Ornette was known to record one track for 40 minutes. And then Donald Harrison, great New Orleans sax player, is one who's been able to put the groove with the blues with the avant-garde of Ornette Coleman. Ornette left us in 2015. His son, Denaro, played with him from the time he was 10 years old, off and on, right up until uh, his father passed away. A lot of musicians said, uh, oh man, don't bring that kid on, you're gonna ruin yourself. Well, you know what? The kid was not a great drummer, but the kid knew what his father wanted and he could feel where his father was going. And as primitive as his technique was, you can still hear the paths moving together. One person simply has more technical ability than the other. From Fort Worth, Texas, one of the most restricted environments, this man rebelled from the beginning. He got out of there as quickly as he could. He could not stand the straight jacket that was Fort Worth, Texas. And he went on to become one of the most creative and innovative forces in modern jazz. And he brought a whole lot of individual musicians from Terrell High School in Fort Worth, Texas with him. And he brought the whole world with him too. I remember a quote that he made near the end of his life. We were having a big celebration of his music. And he said, to the audience of musicians and writers and all that. He says, we can't be against each other. We have to be for each other. And with that, he's talking about the petty criticisms that divide us. One genre from the other, one musician from the other, one instrument from the other, one reed from the other, one type of sight from the other, one whatever from the other. 
We cannot be against each other. We have to be for each other. And when we look at what is going on on the world stage today, on its words are even more poignant and important. We can't be against each other. We've got to be for each other. And that is how all of us grow and bloom. Thank you very much.